Today, the UCD Environmental Humanities and the Architecture and Narrative Research Group at the Humanities Institute are delighted to present Dr. Benjamin Kahan. I met Benji Kahan when he was a postdoctoral fellow at Washington University in St. Louis. Uh, he was at work on a book entitled Celibacies. I was writing a dissertation on singleness. Uh, to say that his work has been an exciting vanguard for me is an understatement. Benji's formulation that, quote, celibacy forges respectability as a revolution has been a provocative idea for the field and certainly for my work. Dr. Kahan is an associate professor at Louisiana State University, where he teaches in women's gender and sexuality studies. He has held postdoctoral fellowships at Washington University, University, Emory University, the University of Pittsburgh, the University of Sydney, the National Humanities Center, and the Reed Foundation. He currently holds a John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Fellowship for the year. He is, as I mentioned, the author of Celibacies, American Modernism and Sexual Life, which came out from Duke in 2013, and the Book of Minor Perverts, Perverts Sexology, Etiology, and the Emergences of Sexuality, out from Chicago in 2019, and a current Modernist Studies Association Book Prize finalist. He's also the editor of Heinrich Kahn's Psychopathia Sexualis, 1844, a classic text in the history of sexuality and the Cambridge History of Queer American Literature, forthcoming from Cambridge, which I think we're all looking forward to. Um, and he's a co-editor of the book series, Theory Q with Duke. Today, Dr. Kahan will explore the relation of realism to voyeurism and exhibitionism through Willa Cather's 1920, Coming Aphrodite. We'll make some time for questions after the talk as well, of course. Please, please join me in welcoming Benjamin Kahan for with Willa Cather's Voyeuristic Realism, The People Subject and the Misses of Sexual Aim. So uh, I just want to begin by um, thanking the Modern Architecture and Narrative Research Group at UCD and the UC Environmental Humanities uh, Fellowship. My, my thanks to Sheree uh, and Hannah, and um, of course, uh, of course, to Kate. Uh, as, as Kate said, um, we uh, we met when when uh, when Kate was a graduate student, and it's just been such an incredible pleasure. Um, watching her career and wa watching her um, uh, just really um, uh, blossom and, um, and and flourish, um, and uh, and her work uh, has, has been so uh, exciting uh, to me too. And I, I can't wait to uh, read the architecture of singleness uh, in, in its entirety. Um, so what I'm going to present to you today is a um, is, is some brand new work. Um, I, I've never presented it before. Um, it's from a new book that I'm working on, um, which is currently called uh, Sexual Aim and Its Misses, and tries to think about um, Freud's category of, of sexual aim. So um, uh, uh, kind of what you want to do to or, or with somebody in bed. Um, so I, I'll say a lot more about sexual aim. Um, as the talk uh, gets going, uh, but uh, without further ado, I'll just I'll just start the talk. Um, the history of the realist novel can often feel heteronormative, with the unfolding of the vicissitudes of the courtship plot ending in the persistent tolling of marriage, marriage, marriage. As Christopher Luby puts it, the novels long affiliation with conventions of romance, and especially its deep investment in narratives of courtship, marriage, and reproduction tend to render it recalcitrant when faced with erotic scripts that ran counter to the novel's historically heteronormative bias. While the novel's heteronormativity Luby references here is implicitly realist, scholars have often demonstrated that queerness structures the heteronormative plotting of the realist novel, excavating the ways in which the courtship plot is structured by an erotics, a female friendship that uh, facilitates heterosexual marriage, as, as Sharon Marcus's work shows us, that queer characters often feature as minor characters in, in such narratives as Nat Hurley's work shows us, and that narrative middles contain moments of queer energy ill-contained by narrative closure, as uh, David Koenig's work shows us. Willa Cather's oeuvre has proven an exceptionally rich case 
for interrogating the relation between queerness and realism. Her fiction draws on the strategies of realism, but her notoriously uneasy relation to realism is also characterized by uh, tinges of queer modernism. In this narrative, realism constitutes her primary mode of telling, and modernism characterizes what uh, remains unsaid, or uh, what Cather calls in, in her uh, in her the novel *De Mugle*, um, her oft-quoted um, statement of art: "The thing not named." Since Sharon O'Brien read this phrase in light of the love that dare not speak its name and the Oscar Wilde trials, it's been inextricably linked with same-sex desire. Moreover, Cather's refusal, preterition, or inability to tell have been central to her understanding of queerness, uh, generating a, a really vibrant tradition of queer Cather scholarship. However, the novel De, de Mugle and it's the thing not named might be read under the sign of a different erotic formation, one made possible by the painstaking work of uh, Richard Harris's little noticed uh, source study about um, coming Aphrodite. Um, the action of uh, Henri Barbusse's voyeuristic novel, Hell, um, 1908, which went through more than 100 editions by 1918, turns on the unnamed narrator's discovery of a peephole in the wall of his squalid and meagerly furnished hotel room. As Harris details, the milieu of hell, characterized by a, quote, inevitable arrangement of the furniture and a, quote, emptiness between these four walls, closely resembles Cather's desired spare room of novelistic prose conjured in the title, the novel de Mugule. From the vantage of this room, Barbusse's narrator observes the room next door with its changing cast of hotel guests, enabling, to him, see, enabling him to see, quote, mankind's innermost secrets, having sex, quarreling, in love, dying, and a thousand un unnamed mundan uh, mundanities and ecstasies of daily life. At the climactic conclusion of Barbusse's text, the narrator observes a scene through the wall in which he overhears a poet declaim to his lover words which will become of crucial importance to Cather. I have such a respect for the absolute truth. There are times when I dare not call things by their name. Reading the thing not named in light of the scene renders voyeurism as a convincing reference for Cather's much interrogated phrase. By reading the thing not named under the sign of voyeurism, this talk builds on analyses of Cather's famous phrase that root it in same-sex desire, and especially those that imagine other possible queer contents like friendship, uh, as in the work of Scott Herring and, and Heather Love, and melancholic erotics, as in the work of Medica Kishi. This talk argues that voyeurism profoundly shapes Cather's oeuvre and theory of the narrative. Voyeurism seems especially prominent when we turn to Cather's uh, novels contemporaneous with the novel De Mugle. Whether it is Anson Kirkpatrick in My Antonia, peeping over the transom, espying a group of girls homoerotically waltzing together, Qua Claude Wheeler in One of Ours, keeping watch like a sentinel over an American soldier and his lady love as the couple passes a romantic evening, or one of the many scenes of voyeurism in The Lost Lady, Cather's mid-career might be called her voyeurism period. Voyeurism enables Cather to disarm realism's heteronormativity, drawing on voyeurism as a queer affordance inherent in realism. Mikhail Bakhtin, who writes that the novel is, quote, essential, essentially a literature of snooping about, of overhearing how others live, suggests that voyeurism has a privileged relation uh, to realism, 
Similarly, Dora Cohen's Transparent Minds underlines Bakhtin's claim when she charts authors' access to, quote, unreal transparencies that reveal characters' inner lives at will. Her analyses demonstrate that realism offers an even more potent observed privacy than that ordinarily granted by voyeurism. Building on these insights, this talk contends that Cather's voyeurism plays an especially prominent role in Cather's realism, one that queer analyses have too often overlooked. In order to chart the under-recognized role of realism in, uh, of voyeurism, sorry, in Cather's realism and her wider career, I read her short story from 1920, Coming Aphrodite, which turns on the discovery of a peephole and is arguably her most sexually explicit work. The story was originally published in bodlerized form under the title Coming Eden Bower in Smart Set, suggesting the extent to which her work was pushing against contemporary sexual mores. The story features two young artists, a painter, Don Hedger, and a beautiful singer, Eden Bauer, the Aphrodite of the title. At the very beginning of their careers, living in the same New York apartment building, shortly after Eden moves in, Don discovers a hole in his closet wall, a conceit also repurposed from Barbusse's hell which permits Don to see into her apartment. He arranges, he, he rearranges his life in order to peer at her daily. They become romantically involved and quarrel over their competing understandings of art until Don storms off when he races back, realizing his foolishness, Eden has already set sail for Europe with a wealthy benefactor. The text's peephole furnishes Cather with an opportunity to uh, theorize two sexualities, um, voyeurism and exhibitionism, which enable her to dodge the heterosexual script of realist plotting. Rather than short-circuiting the queerness of voyeurism as the courtship plot would demand, her work lingers on and luxuriates in voyeurism's pleasures. I conceptualize voyeurism and exhibitionism as aim-based sexualities. Doing so helps us to understand how the so-called courtship plot that dominates much of the history of the novel is bound up with the history of foreplay, which is itself often represented in period marriage manuals as a kind of courtship. Sigmund Freud coins the term sexual aim to describe, quote, modes of gratification. The sexual acts in which one finds pleasure, kissing, copulation, voyeurism, exhibitionism, sadism, masochism, fetishism, etc. He understands aim as one of two elements that compose sexual desire, with the other element being the sexual object or the person from whom attraction emanates. While for Freud, desire is composed of object, the, the person to whom you're attracted, and aim, what you wanna to do to or, or with them. Historians of sexuality have conceptualized our sexual system almost exclusively in terms of object uh, organized by the poles of heterosexuality and homosexuality. While I understand sexual object choice to function as sexuality's dominant and public face, sexual aim functions as sexuality's most familiar system of secondary diacritical demarcation. This more private, less prominent role is essential to understanding the history of modern sexuality as aim furnishes a constitutive and almost wholly forgotten governing logic of sexuality. So you might tell your colleague, you probably would, your, your sexual orientation, but you're probably not going to tell them that you're a fetishist. Right? Um, my talk today is in three parts. The first part argues that conflicting understandings of the nature of sexual aim between Eden and Don 
as well as between Cather's text and contemporary sexologists, crucially structure Cather's coming Aphrodite. In the second part, I argue that Cather's initiation of a break in her realist narrative in the form of an inset story recasts the conflict around sexual aim between Eden and Don. Eden conceptualizes bodily practices as discrete and autonomous, while Don strives to pivot toward understanding these same uh, practices as what uh, Peter Lapson calls a, quote, modal narrative of sex, in which sex is imagined as, quote, not a single event, but as a series of acts whose satisfying consummation required careful activity at every step, close quote. In the third part, I trace the ways in which Cather's story maintains its focus on aim-based desires rather than subsuming them into narrative foreplay in the service of the courtship plot's uh, love narrative. So <clears throat> the first part of my talk is called Conflicting Sexual Aims. Sexual aim furnishes a crucial modality for understanding sexuality in the early 20th century and provides a, a crucially important tool for understanding Cather's oeuvre. For Freud, there are five major non-normative sexual aims or what he thinks of as misses, sadism, masochism, voyeurism, exhibitionism, and fetishism. When these practices have been examined by sexuality studies, they have not been treated in relation to one another, in spite of their conceptualization by sexologists and psychoanalysts as being uh, perversions of like kind. Scholars have also not fully recognized uh, Freud's central insight that all of these non-normative aim-based sexualities are contained within what he understands as uh, normal set sexual practice, which is, which is to say heterosexual intercourse. This is Freud, quote, even in the most normal sexual process, we may detect rudiments, which if they had developed, would have led to the deviations described as perversions, close quote. Here Freud means that looking, displaying, dominating, and being passive, which are all part of foreplay and the preliminary physical activities of heterosexual sex, or at least can be, could become voyeurism, exhibitionism, sadism, and masochism, respectively. This account suggests that aim-based sexualities also hold the key to the historical and theoretical concept of foreplay and help us to understand the construction of so-called normal intercourse. So I think one of the things that my project uh, is also doing is, is, is providing a kind of history of, of foreplay. In one of the only writings that address sexual aim in a sustained way, Arnold Davidson argues that late 19th century sexologists like Richard von Croft Ebbing, uh, Albert Mall, and many others understood that the sexual instinct as having a function and that there was what Davidson calls, quote, unargued unanimity that the natural function of the sex instinct was propagation. This natural function implies a specific object, uh, attraction to members of the opposite sex, and a, a specific aim, uh, a desire for general intercourse with them, Freud's innovation, Davidson argues, is to contend that the sexual instinct does not have a set object or a set aim, um, that they are merely soldered, soldered together um, uh, uh, with the implication that if there's no natural function, there can be no perversions. On the one hand, then, the notion of aims misses might be a misnomer, for at the moment that Freud articulates the concept of sexual aim, he eradicates the very idea that sex has a particular natural aim or function, obviating the possibility of misses. On the other hand, many sexologists, psychiatrists, and other thinkers do not take up Freud's idea that there's no set aim, and Freud himself does not consistently maintain the position, instead seeing uh, heterosexual intercourse as its normal function. Cather extends Freud's theorization of sexual aim and of voyeurism in particular by theorizing sexual aim and its autotelic delights. 
Take, for example, the moment when Don discovers the peephole in coming Aphrodite. And this quotation is, is a bit long and is in the, is, is been pasted into the chat. Um, when, when he took his overcoat from its place against the partition, a long ray of yellow light shot across the dark enclosure, a knot hole evidently in the high wainscoting of the West Room. He had never noticed it before and without realizing what he was doing, he stooped and squinted through it. Yonder in a pool of sunlight stood his new neighbor, wholly unclad, doing exercises of some sort before a long gilt mirror. Hedger did not happen to think how unpardonable it was of him to watch her. Nudity was not improper to anyone who had worked so much from the figure. And he continued to look simply because he had never seen a woman's body so beautiful as this one. Positively glorious in action as she swung her arms and changed from one pivot of motion to another. Muscular energy seemed to flow through her from her toes to her fingertips. The soft flush of exercise and the gold of, of the afternoon sun played over her flesh together, enveloped her in a luminous mist, which as she turned and twisted, made now an arm, now a shoulder, now a thigh, dissolve in pure light and instantly recover its outline with the next gesture. Hedger's fingers curved as if he were holding a crayon. Mentally, he was doing the whole figure in a single running line, and the charcoal seemed to explode in his hand at the point where the energy of each gesture was discharged into the whirling disc of light from a foot or shoulder, from the upthrust chin or the lifted breasts. Here, Don is mesmerized by Eden's numinous beauty, captivated by the sheer loveliness of her body enveloped in a luminous mist. Several scholars have suggested that the imagery of the initial discovery scene is one of masturbation, highlighting the curling extremities gripping a crayon-like penis, followed by explosions and discharges with each gesture. Rather than reading this as a masturbation scene, uh, however, I see him reveling uh, in the experience of observing her glorious beauty, that Hedger's fingers curved as if he were holding a crayon seems of particular importance to the scene, as the phrase exemplifies what Jean Replanche calls, uh, sorry, Jean Replanche calls the metaphorization of uh, sexual aim. Metaphorization for Laplanche summons a scene of fantasy, one that entails not just the satisfaction of a drive in the way that hunger is satiated through feeding, but the displacements, deflections, and excesses of psychical being. In Don's case, sexual, artistic, and psychical aims are fused. His sexual expression is also an emanation of his art, the highest expression of himself. These expressive registers combine the sexual and aesthetic with the ontological, the vision of life that Don wants for himself. We see his aims begin to come into conflict with Eden's aims just before they become lovers. Don invites Eden to go to Coney Island, a popular site for dating excursions, to see one of his working class models, Molly, perform a strip tease balloon act in which she will be launched into the air, removing clothes as she descends. Cather marks the excursion as a class traversal as Eden remembers hearing Molly's rough voice. Um, uh, uh, likewise, when Don says that Coney Island affords the opportunity to quote, see all the people, tailors and bartenders and prize fighters with their best girls, Eden wonders if quote, one ought to be interested in people of that kind, uh, which uh, differentiates her class position. Nevertheless, Eden is especially thrilled by Molly's performance, admiring Molly's legs and requesting to meet her. Eden delights in Molly's company and asks Don to leave the dressing room 
so she can help Molly get ready for the next performance. But she instead switches places with Molly, going up in the balloon herself. As she sails downward to the audience's shouting admiration, Don is furious, quote, dripping with cold sweat. His mouth was full of the bitter taste of anger, and his tongue felt stiff behind his teeth. The scene crucially theorizes the relation between voyeurism and exhibitionism in a way that differs dramatically from period sexologists. One of the leading figures in sexology, Ewan Bloch, contends that, quote, the psychical element of exhibitionism also plays a part in the practice of the so-called voyeurs, that numerous group of male and female individuals who are sexually excited by regarding the sexual acts of other persons, active voyeurs, or who allow themselves to be watched by others when themselves performing sexual acts, passive voyeurs. Here, Bloch imagines exhibitionism and voyeurism to correspond to one another, the obverse and reverse of the same sexual coin. This position is echoed by Magnus Hirschfeld, the so-called Einstein of sex, who avers, quote, there are two main groups of voyeurs, of which one group desires only excitation and satisfaction when they completely occupy themselves with secret things, while the others have the desire to exhibit themselves. Hirschfeld's position likewise sees what we would recognize as voyeurism and exhibitionism as the same sexual pathology. And yet, Hirschfeld's contention that the first group of voyeurs, what he will later call true voyeurs, like to, quote, spy in secret might help us to understand Don's anger and why Eden, as Eden descended, quote, Hedger was determined she should not see him. Don does not want to be seen, does not want to be on display so as to maintain his position as the one looking, but he only wants to observe her privately, secretly. For a voyeur like him, an exhibitionist like Eden is the worst possible object recalling a popular joke that Deleuze tells of a meeting between a sadist and a masochist. The sadist says, oh, sorry, the masochist says, hurt me. And the sadist says, no. Were we to retell it in the context of Cather's describing the meeting between an exhibitionist and a voyeur, it might go something like this. The exhibitionist says, look at me, the voyeur replies, not if you know I'm looking. Um, a version of this admittedly less funny joke transpires when Eden asks Don in reference to their mutual admiration of Molly's positioning of her legs, didn't I hold myself as well as she did? In this question, Don is being asked to share his observations with his object no less, Rather than enjoying them secretly in absorbing sequestration, voyeurism might, contra Hegel, be the one desire which doesn't seek recognition. In contradistinction to Bloch and Hirschfeld, Cather's text theorizes voyeurism and exhibitionism as being out of sync, not complementary opposites, but unaligned structures of desire. Cather suggests that voyeurism does not merely operate as the instinctual reversal of exhibitionism, nor as a straightforward transposition of symptoms. Eden delights in the shouts and the compliments of the crowd, quote, bowing and looking down over the sea of upturned faces, suggesting her arousal by the anonymous looking and adulation. Her desire to be seen as public in general, the publicity and impersonality of her desire makes it wholly incompatible with Don's voyeurism, which requires not just an act looking or an object eaten, but an atmospheric situ uh, situation predicated on a wholly private world of observed intimacy. Eden's exhibitionism jars against uh, the unilateral quality of Don's desire by participating in it. 
If, however, Don's voyeurism and Eden's exhibitionism uh, as, are as incompatible as I've been arguing, how do they become lovers? Uh, perhaps a naive question. Uh, after the balloon ride, one could read Don as attempting to transfigure his voyeurism and Eden's exhibitionism from being autonomous desires to being part of a uh, modal narrative of heterosexuality. In this reading, rather than being perversions or deviant aims, voyeurism and exhibitionism become parts of foreplay headed toward what Henry Abelov memorably calls sexual intercourse, so-called penis and vagina, vagina around penis with seminal emission uninterrupted, close quote. When Eden describes being curiously wrought up by her balloon trip, quote, it was a lark, but not very satisfying unless one came back to something after the flight. We can see that the shift Don strives to effect is already partially successful, as she demotes her exhibitionism from a sovereign sexual practice to a preliminary one. Where earlier Eden found satisfaction in spectacularizing her femininity, showing the crowd what they want, here it's just a lark, not very satisfying, part of a modal narrative that ought to end with sexual intercourse, so-called rather than a fully independent sexual practice. The unnamed, quote, something after the flight takes Don as its object, but could easily take a different object for as Eden later muses, quote, crowds and balloons were all very well, but woman's chief adventure is man. In locating the abstraction of men at the center of female sexuality, Eden uh, eschews what Michelle Barale reads as the lesbian erotics of dressing and undressing with Molly and marginalizes her own exhibitionism, both of which no doubt contribute to her arousal. The generality of man rather than the specificity of Don, unfortunately for him, suggests the partiality of his success, where Don strives for a modal narrative that leads not just to sexual intercourse so-called, but to love and marriage, Eden instead stops at sex. She enacts a phasal narrative with Don fretting that, quote, he won't be the last of Eden's lovers. Uh, oh, sorry, when he uh, frets that he won't be the last of Eden's lovers, to which she rejoins, no, I, I, I suppose not. But what does that matter? You are the first. In contradistinction, contradistinction to Eden's thought about Don being the central adventure of a woman's life, here he's merely foreplay to the coming of Aphrodite, the development of the legendary Eden Bauer who appears magisterially at the text close rather than being foreplay to the more permanent attachments he seeks. These conflicting aims evoking Don's anger are metaphorized in their competing artistic practices after he and Eden become lovers, they have a quarrel over what it means to be successful. When Eden meets a famous artist named Burton Ives and offers to introduce Don to give him a quote, helping hand. Don calls him almost the worst painter in the world and an argument ensues. And um, I'm gonna read a, a second long quote, which has um, uh, also been pasted into the chat. What's the use of being a great painter if no one knows about you, Eden went on persuasively. Why don't you paint the kind of pictures people can understand, and then, after you're successful, do whatever you like? As I look at it, Hedger said, uh, said Hedger brusquely, I am successful. Eden glanced about, well, I don't see any evidences of it, she said, biting her lip. Bert Knives has a Japanese servant and a wine cellar and keeps a riding horse. Hedger melted a little. My dear, I have the most expensive luxury in the world, and I'm much more extravagant than Burton Ives, for I work to please nobody but myself. You mean you could make money and don't? That you don't try to get a public? Exactly. A public only wants what has been done over and over. I'm painting for painters who haven't been born.
Art for Eden is about exposing, showing people what they want to see. Eden's vision of artistic success and her exhibitionism work toward the same aim, adulation, public recognition, and general regard that is depthless and impersonal, suggesting an interdigitation between her sexual and artistic aims. Likewise, Don's voyeurism and his artistic project of trying to learn to paint what people think and feel work toward the same goal, perceiving a timeless and deep truth, one that will be understood by quote, painters who haven't been born and which the world was waiting for. The metaphoricity of these aims and sexual aim more generally extended past the Freudian clinic is important because it suggests that theorizing sexual aim uh, furnishes a no modality for narrating ontology. That is, if sexuality is in the familiar sense the secret of the self, in thinking about sexual aim, we might ask, how does sex help us to achieve our goals in life? What do we want to do with sex? Sexual aim suggests, in other words, what kind of being towards the world one wants to have, how to move through it and find purpose in it. This is the second section of my talk called Narrative Foreplay. As my earlier reworking of Deleuze's joke suggests, aim-based sexualities do not merely involve a specific act or a specific object but demand a specific atmospheric situation, a specific narrative relation between the participants. To put this differently, in Don's case, looking and even looking at Eden are not enough to satisfy or even activate his desire, but instead he must observe her privately and without her knowing. After Eden's balloon riding, the atmospheric and relational conditions of his desire have dissipated, and he tells her the story, the 40 lovers of the queen, about an Aztec queen. Before the story begins, Eden asks Don about a painting of his featuring, quote, supplicating female figures. He hesitates to tell, demurring by saying, quote, I don't know if it's the proper kind of story to tell a girl. She counters with, oh, forget about that. I've been balloon riding today. I like to hear you talk. Here, balloon riding suggests a feminist courage that exceeds the strictures of traditional femininity, an exuberant, ebullient joy and sense of adventure. At the same time, Eden's declaration suggests that balloon riding constitutes her sexual initiation. It functions as an erotic act that serves to credential her to be privy to other modes of sexual knowledge and experience. I dwell on Don's seeking of Eden's consent, a consent that in modern parlance is freely given, reversible, informed, enthusiastic, and specific, because this consent leads the story, uh, lends the story what Eden finds to be its, quote, awful brutality and savagery. That is, he misuses her consent to give her something very different from what she expected, something to antagonize and frighten her rather than please her in order to transform the atmospheric and relational nature of their intimacy. Narratively, this story operates as an inset story resembling Tom Outland's story in The Professor's House. Generically, it is a romance, which as Gretchen Wartendyke argues, was a genre that, quote, thrived upon the danger and possibility that spaces beyond and outside borders, whether psychological, metaphysical, historical, or geographic evoked. Like Outland's story, Don's tale ruptures the realist frame narrative to introduce racial, historical, geographic, and sexual configurations uh, absent from the central realist text. This is the story Don tells, which animates precisely such alternative erotic formations um, and, and, and which this section is, is gonna be uh, focused on. In ancient Mexico, a virgin princess is blessed by servants and possesses the cosmic power to control the rain. When she turns 18, her father goes to war and captures some enemies. Among them is a massive young chief covered in tattoos. The princess begs his life and orders the captive to cover her in tattoos like his own. 
He rapes her, and the guards in turn geld him and tear out his tongue. Meanwhile, the neighboring Aztecs are suffering from drought and send an offer of marriage to the princess to become the queen of the Aztecs. She becomes queen and brings her captive who served her in, quote, everything with entire fidelity and slept upon a mat before her door. Among the captive's duties, he procures men for her. She either talks with them or sleeps with them for one or two nights, and then he kills them. The story ends when she keeps a lover, the captain of the archers, for four nights and orders the captive to let him live. Instead, the captive sends for the king, who then kills the captain and brings the queen and the captive to trial. They are put to death by fire. Scholars typically read Don's narrative as one of gender discipline. In this reading, Don recounts the story of wanton heterosexuality, which finds its analog in Eden's immodest display at Coney Island to chasten Eden back into patriarchal obedient sexuality, a sexuality that Barale describes as, quote, for the use of the gods and the state. While interpreting this romance as conjuring a savage patriarchy to control Eden's sexuality is persuasive, I would caution that reading the queen too readily in the register of heterosexuality might over hastily squelch the complexity of the relation between Don and Eden. For example, it's in no way obvious that the tale is, as Barale puts it, quote, highly effective of bringing Eden into Don's bed. Before he tells the story, quote, Hedger felt a strange drawing near to her. There was an instant communication between them such as there had never been before. Eden feels in his look, quote, something like a chill, except that it was warm and feathery. And he experiences her as, quote, like clay in his hands. To put this differently, before he tells the story, it seems he would have no trouble taking her to bed. But after the story, quote, they walk down the avenue like people who quarreled or who wish to get rid of each other. Rather than understand the story as Barale does then, I see Don's narration as intentionally refusing Eden's advances on her terms. While for Eden, her erotic experiences with Molly and balloon riding have become part of a modal narrative that will culminate with sex with Don, Don doesn't just wanna be the release for her excitement or a temporary outlet for her, arrival, or for her arousal, but wants, as I've been suggesting, to be part of a longer narrative arc culminating in mutual love. Their misalignment is evident in Eden's desire for and consumption of champagne just before Don's narrative. She says to him, quote, perhaps it will make me think I am in the balloon again. That was a very nice feeling. Here the champagne's floating bubbles function as a vehicle to return to the sensation of balloon riding and the accompanying enjoyment of display, suggesting that her con consummation with Don will merely fulfill the release of tension and residual excitement from that experience rather than her actually desiring Don. In this reading, the separation between aim-based autotelic sexualities like exhibitionism and foreplay is not just a muddy one as it was for Freud, but a contested terrain between the soon-to-be lovers. If Eden in displaying herself is no longer going to be Don's secret object of desire, mastered and possessed exclusively by him, then he tells the story to reset the relations between them. At the same time that Don's narration of the 40 lovers of the queen strives to relocate Eden's exhibitionism into the realm of heterosexual foreplay, leading towards sex and mutual love, it simultaneously interrupts the tight reticulation between Reel's narrative, nation, and heterosexuality made familiar to us by uh, critics like Kate McCullough and Elizabeth Friedman by drawing on the historical and extranational resources of romance outlined by Wardendyke. <clears throat> in this latter reading, the story's history and geography garbed in the vestures of myth summons an atmosphere, a surround or scene that both obstructs the glide path to heterosexuality and shifts the emphasis of Cather's short story 
away from the overall plot and character in a way that is homologous to the shift between object choice and aim. That is, it reorganizes the context of their relation. Moreover, to the extent that the short story as a genre is less connected to character development than the novel, and need not follow what Cather calls the usual fictional patterns, close quote, most of which she codes as the dramas of heterosexuality, love affairs, courtships, marriages, and broken hearts, short stories perversely linger, to use Freud's term, on episodes in a way homologous to aim-based sexualities. Further developing this relation to sexual aim, we might interpret the captive story as a narrative primarily about foreplay. The story pays inordinate attention to the procedures of sex, featuring at least three operations for the initiation of sex. The most complex of the three describes how the queen sends the captive to procure a man for her. Quote, the queen had a jewel of great value. When she desired a young man whom she had seen in the army or among the slaves, she sent the captive to him with the jewel for a sign that he should come to her secretly at the queen's house upon business concerning the welfare of all. And some, after she had talked with them, she sent away with rewards and some she, she took into her chamber and kept them by her for one night or two. While I've quoted this procedure at length, it actually isn't even the whole procedure, which includes a complex ritualized killing by the captive. The intricacies here, the sets of repeated possibilities and forking, and forking paths, choosing a man from the army or among the slaves to talk to or have sex with, and if the latter, then for one night or two, suggests a highly regularized and enchaining set of steps. The same is true for the procedure by which the queen sends for the king with either a purple arrow or a white arrow. But the final of these three, which is also the first chronologically in the story, is not repeated and cannot be repeated, namely the queen's rape. The relation between the queen and the captive prior to the rape is highly erotically charged. The lexicon of the story drips with eroticism. The queen's quote desire, the queen quote desired that he should practice his art upon her and prick upon her skin the signs of rain and lightning and thunder. Moreover, she's described as quote, submitting herself to his bone needle and being quote, without shame before him. The eros of tattoos in the West has a long history dating at least as far back as Joshua Reynolds' painting of Omai in 1776, in which Omai's tattoos proved tantalized, provoked tantalizing speculation about what else might be hidden uh, by his clothes. Historically closer to Cather's writing, uh, sexology saw tattooing as carrying a heavy erotic charge Bloch, for example, comments, there is no doubt that tattooing was done principally for the purpose of sexual attraction and excitation. With this history in mind, we might read the captive narrative as quite unjustly blaming the queen for her own rape, uh, since in Don's telling, it seems to imply that the queen erotically invited the captive into her bedroom and engaged in prolonged or play with him. His punishment for the rape will be that he is permanently consigned to foreplay, as though summoning a foretime, a prehistory in which the rape hasn't transpired or has been undone. He literally sleeps outside the queen's door, bearing a vestibu vestibular relation to sexual access to her and sex more generally. Forced to listen to her copulation as he, tongueless and gelded, uh, can neither speak nor have sex as the queen's lovers do. He's cast in the role of unwilling voyeur and thus resembles Don's own forced watching at Coney Island. Moreover, as the other two procedures of sex, procuring and summoning the king demonstrate, he is the messenger of foreplay. But the story leaves two questions unanswered. Why does he so faithfully serve her and why does he betray her? 
One answer is that he both loves her, having fallen in love with her while tattooing, but knowing that his status as a slave would make their love an impossibility, he rapes her. He tries to make amends by faithfully serving her when it seems as though she has fallen in love with the captain, keeping him for four days, being greatly content with him and sparing his life. The captive cannot bear to see her in love with another and thus alerts the king rather than castigating in Eden or manipulating her into bed. Then perhaps we can read Don's narration of the story as a profession of love, one that acknowledges the violence that he's inflicted on Eden, much as the captive does, by revealing his own savagery. That is, the narration of the story affects Don's shift in aim from voyeurism to love. Such a trajectory might mark the moment from so-called pathological aim to a more socially sanctioned one. Um, so uh, I think I will just um, uh, stop there. Um, uh, I, I think um, uh, we're uh, running a little short on time and I'll just uh, uh, open it up uh, for uh, Q&A. Thank you so much for just a, a fabulous talk. Um, my mind is spinning in many directions. Um, so if you're willing, uh, we'll have a bit of Q&A. Uh, so folks, if you'd like to ask a question, please use the chat window to either pose your question um, and I'll read it out uh, or to indicate that you'd like to ask one live. I just realized I have not turned my video on. Sorry, hello everybody. Um, and either way, uh, we'll get your questions in the queue. Um, and a, a short reminder, we are recording this talk, so any live questions will be a part of the recording to be posted later. Um, I will indulgently start off. <laughs> um, Benji, I wonder, you said a lot about voyeurism and narrative, and, I, and I'm kind of um, wanting to ask you more about that. I wonder if you can situate the relation of voyeurism and aim to other approaches to narrative form. You know, my mind goes straight to narrative framing in Cather, um, to works on Amy Kaplan about narrative and power and, and looking. Um, I'm thinking also when I, get, when I go to Cather of uh, my Antonia and the sort of idea that it's always a series of frames. So in short, uh, how does Cather's voyeurism intersect with her other narrative forms? Yeah, no, um, I think, you know, I was trying to think about how um, in, in this in this talk about how voyeurism kind of works with the kind of inset and thinking a bit about how um, uh, the inset really allows Cather to kind of um, introduce um, these kind of uh, more romantic elements um, uh, to the story. Um, that, um, and, and the kind of like affordances around romance, right? Um, yeah. So I think that the captive um, story allows, um, uh, really kind of allows Cather to um, introduce these kind of like other geographic and kind of like racial um, spaces um, that kind of um, enable uh, her to, um, uh, think about how um, how kind of uh, voyeurism kind of operates, and I, I think that there there's also a way in which um, you know I think that there's been you know obviously an enormous effort to um, to queer Cather, yeah, uh, and I think that I kind of want like an even queerer Cather, right? <laughs> um, one that um, doesn't. Um, kind of like just, I mean, just kind of think about her kind of relation to um, sort of um, gay male culture um, or um, uh, kind of lesbian um, cultures, um, but also kind of thinks about these these other sort of like less talked about um, uh, uh, modes or, uh, of desiring. Um, yeah. yeah, great. Thank you. Um... There's, there's a, a lot for me to think about there. Um, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Sheree, who's got our next question. Yeah, so I sort of have um, two questions. One is perhaps a little unfair because it wasn't the main subject of your talk, but because this was sort of um, sponsored in part by the architecture strand, and we were also very interested in built environment, I wondered if you could just say a bit more about 
space, the house, the apartment block, the roof, the ways that spaces and, and Washington Square, the public, the way the public and the private operate at a kind of spatial level in this story, and the particular kinds of new modes of subjectivity that might be, and sexuality that might be emerging because of the forms of privatization of life um, within the city, within this particular urban space that we get in that story. And because space is so frequently, you know, it's constantly talking about, you know, borders and doorways and holes and black and white, like all these, as you were saying, these kind of boundaries are coming up. So I was particularly interested in, in the ways in which the stories in some ways is reflecting on the kind of particular social conditions um, and subjectivities that are enabled by the actual um, buildings themselves, the built environment. So that's my first question, a little messy, like I said, not exactly fair, but maybe you could even elaborate on the notion of voyeurism um, and exposure in relation to those kind of public private divides a bit more. Um, and my second point was, I guess I'm getting a little um, as a kind of post-colonialist by my own training, like I, my, my kind of like alarm bells go off when I see that kind of Aztec story and in, in, in the inset and in, in the kind of story within the story. And it's not that unreminiscent from, in some ways, other writers in her moment also exploiting sexuality. D.H. Lawrence, for example, looking at, um, you know, uh, American Indian and Mexican um, sort of material to try to enjoy inject some sort of primitivism in, into his work in a way that might kind of queer or disrupt the conceptions of sexuality and class that are sort of dominant within his moment, or other writers looking to material from Africa, from other sites that are often othered or perceived as somehow savage or barbaric. So I know that you were trying to complicate that narrative of it just being about savage patriarchy to redefine her. And I understand you were giving a very kind of subtle reading there of it, but the particular kind of work of racialization that that story is doing um, in to read that entirely, on, you know, sort of, um, you wouldn't want to read it un, entirely celebratorily as a kind of celebration of her, of that queen of queerness, if, you're, if that is dependent on a certain kind of conception of otherness, I think, or of alterity in some ways. So I just wonder if you could say a bit more about that, because like I, I was just kind of wrestling with it as I, as I was trying to remember the story and exactly how it was kind of working. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, these are these are both really, really, um, uh, you know, uh, tremendous questions. Yeah. So just like a little biographical detail, like this apartment is 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 sort of the apartment that um, uh, Catherine lived in when she moved to New York and. Um, her partner, um, uh, her life partner, Edith Lewis, um, uh, also lived in this apartment building. And so I think that there's a way in which, you know, it, it would be, you know, pretty easy to read this story as, you know, um, Cather is Don and, you know, um, Aphrodite is, is Edith and, and, you know, it's, it's really a story, a kind of autobiographical story about their, um, about their, about their love affair, right? Um, uh, uh, so, um, you know, uh, that, you know, I think, I think there's, it would be, you know, um, a, a very, a, a kind of very straight, a straightforward kind of queer, queer reading of, of the story um, in that way. Um, but, uh, you know, in order to think about the, I think the the architecture of the apartment in the story is quite interesting. Um, they uh, they actually kind of live in in the same apartment, um, and uh, there's a, a kind of door that separates the apartment. Um, so uh, that has a lock, which is only on Edith's side, um, and so. Um, uh, there's a way in which, like, an Eden sort of, like, smashes open the lock, and there's a, you know, like, which is, you know, uh, kind of, like, symbolic of, you know, her chastity, um, right, and so we could read this as, like, um, a really kind of, um, a really kind of progressive sexual story from the 20s of, like, you know, of, of, of kind of, like, female, new woman, sexuality, right, um, in, in this way. Um, and, uh, you know, and I, I think, you know, people have, have made that, have made that argument, right, which is kind of like, 
you know, spatially um, kind of plays out, right? Um, uh, but, you know, to your other point, um, which I, I think is, is a really crucial one about um, Cather's, um, you know, the really kind of like deeply uncomfortable kind of like, you know, I mean, right, so we might say, if the, is that progressive story about white female uh, femininity kind of like built on the back of this sort of really ugly history of uh, bloody history, you know, of of colonialism and racialization. I think the answer is like definitely yes, right? Um, and you know, nobody really ever reads Cather to like look for like you know progressive, you know, racial or colonial politics, right? I mean, almost, you know, like all of her work, you know, has these kind of like deeply uncomfortable, you know, I, which I, I think connects up with with Kate's question as well, right? Which often come in in these frame narratives, right? Um, so there's a way in which, right? I mean, I, I think you know, um, <clears throat> you know, in um, you know, I, I think right, like we we could say that like Cather becomes interested in Native Americans like at the moment that they're becoming extinguished, right? Um, uh, right at the, at the moment in which like you know the U.S. is sort of ending its or maybe not, at least ending the major phase, I should say, of its genocidal campaign against Native Americans, um, right? And so I, I think that there is a real way in which um, any kind of um, gender or sexual progressiveness, right? And I, I think, right, this is like also a story of like white feminism in general, right? Is that like, in general, like right, white feminism is often built on kind of like these, you know, kind of uh, you know deeply ugly, problematic, eugenic um, narratives of, of of racialization and, and, and colonization. We're going to uh, switch over to Anne Fogarty, who also has a question. Yes, hi. And this is my co-chair of architecture and narrative. <laughs> Um, mm -hmm. Hi, Benji. I love I loved your paper. And um, my question is somewhat linked with um, Sheree's second one. Um, there's another kind of narrative strand or set of strands to do with hygiene and the dog. And the mm -hmm. disreputable Irish janitress was a new word to me, um, landlady, who then sends in a cleaning woman who makes his apartment even dirtier. And the bathroom seems to be another kind of where is before he gets to the peephole, he's already kind of seen her in the bath. Which of course the dog has been sharing, and there's obviously some kind of there's um there's a triangulation there between the dog um and him and her um going on too. So it's another kind of queer space and zone, architecturally mm -hmm. conceived and also racially conceived and um across species as well. So just a question about all of that. Yeah, no, I, I thank you so much. Uh, that was that's a, such a it's such an amazing um it's it's such an it's such an uh, amazing question, right? So just to pick up on some of the things that, that Anne was uh, talking about. So the, for those of you who haven't read the story, it, it features, Don has a, a dog who's kind of like an avatar of him, of his. And the dog is, as, as Anne suggests, like in some ways, like Eden's like erotic rival, right? So the dog bites Eden at one point and she, the dog kind of growls at Eden. And like when Don hangs out with the dog, uh, with Eden, um, the dog is totally jealous, like, oh, can we go back to the good old days when I'm the master and like the master and the pet hang out, um, like I miss it. Uh, <laughs> and, um, you know, right, so the dog is this kind of like really cute kind of character in, in the story, right? Um, and, but to, to you know, to, to answer more specific, that's the, the plot summary, but um, to answer Anne's question, right, um, Ruth Vanita has this really interesting reading, which I totally recommend to all of you in a place that you would never guess. I think it's called like, it's a book called like Sappho and the Virgin Mary, right? So you, you wouldn't expect, but like, she's got this chapter in that book, which is about how uh, companion animals are often like kind of like vehicles for uh, queer erotics. Um, and, um, you know, and I, I think like, you know, if we think of like my dog Tulip or, you know, a work of uh, like that, um, uh, 
uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of kind of queer, there's a lot of queerness around, around. So what, what, what Ruth Benita says is that, um, that if you can love an animal, you can love anything kind of, right? And so like, if, 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 if animal love is acceptable, surely love between any two people should be acceptable, right? And so uh, Ruth Benita kind of like makes the case that like, um, uh, that, uh, kind of in in sort of enshrining and celebrating kind of animal human erotics, um, there's a way in which um, you know you are kind of validating um, kind of queer love, right? Um, is is kind of uh, Benita's argument. Um, but to go back to your uh, the, the kind of like first part of your question, right, about um, uh, the kind of like uh, laundress, right? Um, uh, uh, the, this kind of like um, you know, also a kind of uh, racialized figure that that Don is is sort of you know like so um, uh, kind of like makes the apartment dirtier, right? Um, and um, I think uh, right. So Don kind of lives in this kind of like super dirty apartment, and and Eden's apartment is is pristine. And yeah, I think that there is um, that you know. Yeah, I, th I think that I think that you know I think that you could also read that as you know helping to construct that Don's dirtiness kind of helps to construct Eden's like racial purity or pure white of pure whiteness. Like her skin is like you know just I think it's described as like alabaster, right, or ivory or something like that. Um, she's sort of like as white as white gets, right? She's the whiteness of whiteness, kind of. Um, and so I think, I think, yeah, I think that it really does connect up exactly with, um, uh, you know, what I was saying about the frame narrative, right? Um, yeah, so. We've only got, we've got space for about one quick uh, last question. So I think I'm going to jump on uh, the section where Benji talked about the uh, history of foreplay and ask you to just say a couple words about where this project is going and is that it? <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> No, 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 that, 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 sounds, that sounds fantastic. Yeah, so um, I'm just at the beginning of this project. You know, this is, this is my first time ever presenting this piece. So, um, so thank you for being such a great audience. Um, uh, I, um, yeah, so the, I'm imagining the project is, is really happening over a long durée. Um, so it's going to start in the 17th century. And, um, and, and, and kind of move to the 20th century. And um, in the, one of the other pieces that I've written already, um, is, is a kind of history of foreplay, which is a strangely untheorized concept. Um, and, um, uh, on the one hand, you have, um, Henry Ablov's just, like, utterly, stunningly brilliant essay called, um, uh, it's in Deep Gossip called something like Some Speculations on, a, a blank on the title, but, like, um, you know, it's on the nature of sexual intercourse in the British 18th century. Um, and uh, I've totally mangled the title, so forgive me, um, Henry. Um, but uh, the, the, but anyway, it's, it's like a kind of eight page essay. Um, so it's really, really short. Um, but, it, you know, every, every sentence is a kind of luminous gem where he, um, he sort of says that the foreplay starts in the 18th century. Um, and then on the other hand, you have a lot of people like Peter Leipzig and, um, you know, and others who, who, who make the case that foreplay is really a 20th century invention. Um, and uh, what I do in, in my chapter is, is make the case that actually for, foreplay is already extant in the 17th century. And I, I sort of trace its development from the 17th century uh, to the 20th. Um, uh, uh, and so, so one one piece of the of this of this of this of this of this book is, is a kind of history of foreplay, um, but I think, you know, um, uh, that Matt Holbrook, uh, uh, kind of uh, who's a sort of esteemed British British uh, historian of sexuality, one of the one of the best people writing on sexuality today, um, especially if you're interested in the 20th century British context, um, I really recommend for London. Um, he he says, like, you know, what's weird about the history of sexuality is 
there's no sex in it, right? You just read it. It's desire, desire, desire. And this book, my book, um, is about putting the history of sexual practice back into the history of sexuality, right? Um, that, you know, Holbrook says, you know, we're too Foucauldian, right? There's, there's, there's no sex in, there's no sex in the history of sexuality. So like, you know, right, you, you, you read so many books and queer studies and you're like, huh, there's not, there's no sex in here. Um, and like, you know, occasionally there's like some sodomy or whatever. Um, uh, but in general, there's, there's not a lot of sex. And this book is really about, um, about what it is that people do in bed. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, what, you know, to think about Amber Holiba's question, like, what are we rolling around in bed with? Um, and, um, so, uh, yeah, uh, this project is, is kind of about thinking about the history of, of sexual practices and, um, and in that way, um, all of the texts, including this one are either, um, censored or bodlerized or, um, really just straight up pornographic. Um, uh, so I think another goal of the project is really to, um, think the history of pornography back into the history of sexuality as this incredibly rich repository for, um, the documenting and recording of at least the fantastical shape of, um, sexual practices. Um, and I think that there's a lot of reasons why, um, the uh why pornography has not really been um a big part of of queer studies um and i think that one of those reasons right is that queer studies at least in english has really attached itself to high cultural objects right so you think about cedric's kind of reading henry james and proust or um right and so the, the kind of you know right uh or there's so much work around queer shakespeare right um, and so kind of attaching, um, attaching yourself to a high cultural object is a way of overcoming the field's difficulties with respectability, with establishing respectability. And I think that now that the respectability of the field is at least, you know, um, fairly established, at least in the U.S. context, um, although I'd be interested to, to hear more about the Irish context from you all, um, uh, the... Um, the respectability is, is on somewhat firmer foundation. I think that we can turn to these kind of, um, you know, you know, derided um, sort of low cultural objects, right? Which is, you know, let's say straight up dis disreputable, right? Um, these pornographic texts. Great, thank you so much. I, uh, I think you're just right. Um, uh, I, I want to thank uh, my colleagues at the Environmental Humanities uh, and Architecture Narrative. I want to thank the Humanities Institute and our wonderful audience. Thank you all for joining us. Um, and most of all, I want to thank our speaker, Benjamin Kahn. Thank you so much, Benji, for joining us today. Um, it's been fantastic. So if we could all uh, unmute ourselves and, and give Benji a quick round of applause. Thank you all. Awesome.